1975 and returned to Australia, where as a child he lived in Perth. That's okay, we can forget that. And he completed his PhD in the Cornish in South Australia at the University of Adelaide in 1978. In 79, he joined the Royal Navy as an officer in the instructor branch, training at the Britannia Royal Naval College and at sea in HMS Intrepid before being appointed to HMS Fisgard in Cornwall. In 89, he was appointed senior lecturer of the Department of History and International Affairs at the Royal Naval College, Greenwich. And in 1990, he gained a second doctorate. So maybe you should have been called him Dr. Doctor. <laughs> If you watch Faulty Towers, you'll know the uh, From the University of Plymouth for the study of modern Cornwall from a centre periphery perspective. Um, in 91, he then he joined the University of Exeter as director of the Institute of Cornish Studies and was promoted reader first in 95 and then professor in 2000. He was elected an honorary fellow of the prestigious Australian Academy of Humanities in 2013. His recent books include Making Muta, The Invention of Australia's Little Cornwall, from the University of Exeter Press in 2007, and Regional Australia and the Great War, The Boys from Old Kia, University of Exeter Press again in 2012, the latter being about copper mining communities of the north of York Peninsula and the First World War. The Dunstan Foundation is indeed very honoured and pleased to work with Professor Payton, and I now welcome him to present the Dunstan Foundation About Time History Month Lecture, 1848 and all that, the Cornish uh, and the origins of South Australian labour. Please welcome Professor Payton. Thank you, Lynn, for that very full introduction and uh, the biography. I thought, oh, yes, this is my life story <laughs> here. So uh, all I have to do is to master this and, uh, and we should be away. I tend to wander about, so if there comes a point during the course of the lecture when all this goes flying, uh, <laughs> don't be alarmed. We'll, Ben's help will quickly put it uh, back together again. Well, thank you so much for coming along this evening. Um, we heard in um, Dr. Arnold's introduction there about the, uh, the first full Labour government in South Australia, but also in the world, um, which is a great milestone. What I want to do, though, is to look back even before that great milestone of 1910, back to the earlier days of South Australia. Um, I've called my talk, as you see, um, slightly tongue-in-cheek, 1848 and all that. Um, for many of you, the historians amongst you, 1848 will resonate because that was the year of European uh, revolution, and uh, you're probably sitting there quizzically thinking, how does that fit in with South Australia? Well, it does, as we shall see, but the story, I hope, will unfold. Um, I've got a few slides that I'll show you. Um, the technology always runs away with me, so I haven't got a huge number, um, but I'll just uh, use them by way of giving you glimpses into, as way marks as it were, into what I'm going to be talking about this evening. Now, hooray, the first picture comes up. We're going to be talking about the Borough Mine. Um, many of you will have visited the Borough Mine. Many of you will be very familiar with it. It's uh, one of South Australia's, um, I suppose, greatest treasures, really. Um, this is a picture of it, I think, probably uh, 1860s, 1870s. I'm not sure. The mining experts amongst you would be able to date it within a week, I'm sure. But it gives a very good impression of what the borough mine looked like uh, at its zenith when it was working. So try and take, take it in, as it were, absorb that photograph, because it will be the background for quite a lot of what I shall be talking about. Um, I shall also be referring to this man, uh, hero maybe, or um, maybe not, to make up your own mind. This is Henry Ayres. Uh, after whom the big rock in the middle of Australia used to be named. Um, here he is, looking the imposing character that he was. He will be featuring in this story as well. Um, here are Cousin Jacks, Cornish miners, in their unmistakable Cousin Jack garb with their white duck coats and, uh, and felt helmets and clay, uh, clay 
adherent, as it were, for their candles on the top of their helmets and so on and so forth. Fine looking people. I've been talking about Cousin Jacks and the way they are imagined as fine looking people, sturdy people, reliable people. But I'll also be talking about um, these people. These are actually smugglers, but I'm using them in a more generic sense. This is a picture of Cornwall from about the same time as those upstanding Cousin Jacks. And they represent an entirely different imagining of Cornwall and the Cornish. They're a pretty grim lot, as you can see, armed with cudgel. Uh, they look a hard uh, bunch of men. They're engaged in smuggling here, but they might have been wrecking, or they might have been rioting. We're going to talk a bit about rioting in a moment. Oh, there we are. Um, this is um, Methodist Church at uh, Redruth, actually. That's Redruth in the borough, not Redruth in Cornwall. Uh, the one in the borough is named after the Cornish one, as you perhaps will know, I'm sure. And Methodism uh, features in my story as well. Um, so does Northern York Peninsula. Um, although I'm starting in 1848 and I'm starting with borough, I'm finishing up here in Northern York Peninsula. This is Moon to Mines. So I'm finishing up just talking briefly about what actually happened at the end of tonight's story, which is the emergence of organised trade unionism uh, in the copper mines of South Australia in the latter part of the 19th century, tentatively in the 1860s and then with more confidence in the 70s and beyond, helping to build up that labour movement which led to John Verham's government in 1910 to 12, uh, Dr. Arnold was referring to earlier on. But I want to slip back to the beginning now, like a still master of this technology. Yes, there we are. Um, as I've already kind of hinted to you, in the 1840s, and we're talking about 1848 and all that, there were two imaginings of the Cornish miner. And I want you to carry these imaginings in your mind as the story unfolds. The first of them was this one. Um, the Cornish miner as Cousin Jack. Here the Cornish were seen to be quintessentially miners. And there was a myth, as I called it, a myth of Cousin Jack, a myth of the Cornish miner, um, which the Cornish had essentially constructed around themselves. But in doing so, they had sold effectively to the mining companies of the world who were at this very period, period uh, expanding the international mining frontier. We have to remember perhaps in the years after 1815, New World Compact and all that, the international mining uh, uh, frontier expanded rapidly and continued to do so through the 19th century. And against the background of that rapid uh, that rapid expansion, the Cornish, the Cornish miners, the Cousin Jacks, constructed their own particular story about themselves, um, which rapidly became an accepted imagining of what the Cornish miner was. As I said already, these are upright, um, reliable, dependable looking uh, chaps, and this is part of the map, part of the myth. But the myth of Cousin Jack essentially said, and this is a story that the Cornish have told about themselves and which people across the world increasingly bought as well, that the Cornish, the Cornish miners, were somehow innately equipped as hard rock miners in a way that others weren't, particularly potentially competing ethnic groups. And this is, I say, the story the Cornish told about themselves um, and which became commonplace on the international mining frontier. So that was the first great imagining of the Cornish that existed in the 1840s in the middle of the 19th century. Um, just to give you a flavor of that, one quotation from slightly later on, 1859, one observer um, of the Cornish, the Cornish miners, wrote with glowing approval, says, the Cornish are remarkable for their sanguine temperament, their indomitable perseverance, their ardent hope and adventure, and their desire for discovery and novelty. To this very cause, a science 
to boast of so many brilliant ornaments who claim Cornwall as their birthplace. Well, that was overdoing it, of course, uh, and yet it was a very articulate um, expression of the myth of Cousin Jack. This is what the Cornish wanted to believe about themselves. It's certainly what they wanted other people to believe, uh, to believe about them. But there was another imagining of the Cornish. We've seen them already. Here they are. Um, the antithesis of what I've just been describing. Um, these are smugglers, but in the 1840s, in the middle of the 19th century, uh, people still remembered what was called the lawless tenor. Cornwall was still in the popular minds and popular conception of many people, West Barbary, a name that kind of says it all. Cornwall is a fearsome place, the Cornish as a fearsome people. The Cornish were known throughout the UK, throughout the world perhaps, um, for their propensity to riot. The food rioters of Cornwall punctuated the 18th century. Whenever there was a period of dearth or downturn um, in Cornwall, the, uh, the rioters would be out on the street. And the lawless tenor, the Cornish tenor, the Cornish miner, uh, was seen to be uh, the worst of the perpetrators of the Cornish riot. In the 1840s, uh, the riot as a means of achieving fair prices, which is the aim of the food riots, um, uh, uh, resurge, and there is a resurgence, as it were, with a vengeance. And uh, hungry 40s in Cornwall, when the potato crop fails, as it does in Ireland, <coughs> as it does in uh, in the Highlands and Islands of Scotland, so it too fails in Cornwall. And uh, one of the consequences of that is the turn to riot, almost inevitably, according to this imagining of the Cornish miner, as a means of addressing the problems that had emerged. Um, again, a nice example. This is from a, a newspaper called the West Britain, which is the main newspaper in Cornwall in the middle of the 19th century. And, uh, and it describes one of these incident, incidents in 1847, right in the heart. Uh, of the period we're talking about on the eve, of course, of 1848 and all that. And it describes a riot, a food riot, at a place called Wade Bridge on the north coast of Cornwall. Quite a central place in Cornwall, for those of you who know Cornwall, also a port. And it was a port from which, despite the failure of the potato crop, and despite the widespread hunger that that had caused, particularly amongst the mining, population for whom the potato was a staple, rather as it was amongst many communities in Ireland. Despite all that, uh, wheat and barley were still being exported from Cornish ports, rather as it was from Irish ports as well. It's a familiar sto uh, story in Ireland. Interesting to see the story replicated in Cornwall uh, as, it, as it were. And, uh, and we see the West Britain here reporting on a couple of days, actually, of riot, of forcing of fair prices at the port of Wake Bridge. And it tells us how one group of rioting tinners had turned up and had been turned away, um, implicated by giving, handing out of bread and so on and so forth. And then the next day, this happens. The owners of the corn in the cellars, this is at Wake Bridge, proceeded to ship it onto a vessel. When information was received that a large body of men from the nearby Delabol Quarry was approaching. And soon after, about 400 men entered the town and proceeded at once to the quay. As a great proportion of the men were really in want of food, the magistrates and others purchased all the bread procurable in the town and distributed it among them, each receiving half a, a, half a part of a loaf on his passing over the bridge on his way home. So again, the magistrate imagined that they had um, prevented a full-scale riot in the nick of time. And yet, as the West Britain continues, <coughs> but a rumour was spread that the party of the preceding day were again at hand. The people who had been implicated the day before were back. This rumour was soon realised, and between three and four hundred men entered the town, each armed with a bludgeon. 
rather like those, I guess, and marched on the quay, cheering as they proceeded. The quarrymen, or most of them, because the people had just been given bread, uh, as, uh, then returned and mixed with other streamers, China clay men, and miners from Roach, Auxilians and Austal, and other places, and when assembled together, they presented a most formidable appearance and created great consternation. So this was the image of the lawless tenor, still abroad, still alive in Cornwall in 1847. Um, so there were these two contrasting, two different, but in a strange sort of way, as we shall see, complementary imaginings of the Cornish, Cornish miner in the 1840s. On the one hand, the cousin Jack, uh, the person that if you were an international mining company, you needed their expertise. If you were opening up the copper and gold and silver mines of Latin America, or the copper mines of Michigan, or the lead mines of Wisconsin, then you turn to the Cornish. Um, but in turning to the Cornish, you had at the back of your mind too, perhaps, their reputation for riot. Uh, an equivocal view of the Cornish and what they were capable of. And that equivocal view existed in South Australia as much as it existed anywhere else. Perhaps it existed more in South Australia. Um, where are we? Can we go back? Uh, no. Oh, yes. There we are. Henry Ayres. There he is. Secretary of the South Australian Mining Association, which ran the Borough of Borough Mine. He was well aware of those two conflicting constructions, those two conflicting imaginations of the Cornish miner. And he clearly turned them over in his mind. Um, we know that he was one of the key advocates for bringing Cornish miners to South Australia in the 1840s in the wake of the discovery of copper at uh, first at Kapunda, of course, and then at Barra Barra. Uh, we know that uh, he entered into extensive correspondence with emigration agents in uh, Cornwall, not only in the 1840s, but in the 1850s as well, uh, particularly a fellow called J.B. Wilcox, who was an emigration agent just across the border in Devon, um, but who had sub-agents throughout Cornwall and throughout the mining districts of Western Devon. And uh, the relationship between Wilcox and Ayres as it developed was critical in building up the body of Cornish miners uh, at the borough and then responding to the Victorian gold rush when it lured many of the uh, borough Cornish miners away. Um, that, that's way beyond our story today, but it's, it's indicative of the relationship that existed between Ayres and Wilcox and the recruiters in Cornwall. And uh, if you look through the passenger lists, which are in the State Library here, uh, in the 1840s, you will see page after page of ships um, calling into Plymouth and coming out to Adelaide full of Cornish miners and their families. It's up there with uh, detailed notes about some of the individuals and the particular skills that they were bringing out to the mine. So there's no doubt Henry Ayres was very keen to acquire Cornish personnel and Cornish skills generally. Um, we can go back and find our picture of the bar of mine. There it is. That is a Cornish mining landscape. Any of you who have been to Cornwall will recognise the features, not least the uh, the sort of engine houses which house the Cornish beam engines. Um, that technology was brought to Cornwall, was brought to South Australia from uh, from Cornwall, uh, quite literally. Uh, beam engines were built, uh, assembled in kit form, put onto ships, brought across, taken across country, very, <coughs> diff very, very difficult, and then reassembled at Borough and at other places. Um, and amazingly, they worked, and worked tremendously well. Um, so technology was matching the skills, and also the organisation of Cornish mining. And this is an important part of the 1848 story. Um, in Cornwall, and thus, because um, Henry Ayres and the South Australian Mining Association essentially wanted to construct Cornish mines, they adopted the Cornish method 
uh, employment in which effectively part of the entrepreneurial function, if I can use that slightly grand word, was performed by the, uh, the miners themselves. But rather than working as mere employees, they were in one sense self-employed. Um, they worked in small groups called pairs, not necessarily two, in fact normally more than two, but they were called pairs. And they worked in two, two kinds of contract, one called tribute and the other called cut work. Now in tribute, a pair of Cornish miners, um, or pairs of Cornish miners, would compete one against another uh, for particular plots of the mine, pitches as they were known. And that pitch would be awarded to that pair, which would be the lowest in terms of their expectation of how many shillings in the pounds value of worth of the ore extracted that they were willing to work for. You can see what I mean. Kind of downward bidding. Um, top, work, top workers, by contrast, were paid not according to the value of the ore one, but, but according to the amount of dead ground driven. So they were the people who drove tunnels and sunk shafts and so on and so forth. And they were paid according to the distance, the amount of earth that they had removed. So tribute and tuck work, um, slightly different concepts, and yet united in the sense that they were both contract work. Um, and that's an important part of the story. It's certainly an important part of the Cornish mine that Henry has constructed um, along with the South Australian Mine Association at the Borough Mine. Um, Henry Ayres went out of his way, as I say, to encourage immigration. When a Cornwall and Devon society was formed in South Australia at the end of the 1840s, um, Henry Ayres was enthusiastic. Um, he allowed his chief captain, Henry Roach, who came from Cornwall, who also been out in Columbia, South America, uh, to sit on the committee. And the aim of the Cornwall and Devon society was to lobby for more people to come out from the mining areas of uh, Cornwall and Western Devon. So Henry Ayres agreed that that was a good thing. And yet, like all good capitalists, he was worried that, um, about the degree of control he could exert over his uh, newly recruited workforce, not least given the reputation of the lawless tenor about which he knew. Um, he built cottages for, um, first of all, some of his more senior employees, and then generally for other employees as well. Now, you might say, well, well, he might, because there were no homes at the, at the bar, and indeed many resorted either to digging their own dugouts on the Borough Creek, or erecting with the tacit approval of the mine company, at least up until 1848, of rough and ready makeshift cottages around the mines themselves. Um, but as we shall see as the story unfolds, the fact that there are company cottages in which miners um, live becomes an important part of the relationship between the workforce and Henry Ayres and his South Australian Mining Association. Um, Henry Ayres is also keen to, denote, to, to donate or to lease for peppercorn rent uh, land for Methodist chapels. Um, Methodism is a central plank of the Cornish identity at this time. And uh, there are several competing denominations, and they are competing. They're, they're anxious to, to uh, maximize their congregations, and so on and so forth. And the Wesleyans and the Bible Christians, the Primitive Methodists, and other kinds of Methodists are competing um, to uh, really stamp their, their presence on the landscape in South Australia generally at the bar of mine. Um, Henry Ayres thinks this is a good thing because Methodism has a strong moral code and if people can be encouraged to join the Methodist congregations, uh, then this will be a means of civilizing the, uh, uh, the populace. It will be a means of perhaps social control, um, certainly the means by which Methodist ministers can direct a flock that otherwise might have um, run off in all kinds of directions. There's an irony here, as we shall see, which I shall unveil um, as the story goes on. But for the moment, Henry Ayres uh, thinks the building of Methodist chapels, the encouragement of Methodism, 
uh, is a good thing um, because it is part of molding a society in which the behavior of the lawless tinner, should it ever erupt, is going to be moderated. Um, it's going to prevent it uh, from exhibiting its worst excesses. And there is evidence for Henry Eyre that, you know, that this is working. The Reverend Daniel Draper, who's not Cornish, but he's a Wesleyan minister, sent out from Britain. And in 1847, he writes to the Wesleyan Methodist magazine. And he says very positively, very glowingly, I think, I have the pleasure to inform you that a new Wesleyan Methodist chapel has now been opened at the famed Borough Borough Mine, 100 miles north of Adelaide. The proprietors, this is Henry Ayres and South Australian Mining Association, the proprietors leased me an acre of land for 99 years, and I laid the foundation stone of the chapel in March last. Since that time, the course has improved through the labours of local preachers and the zeal and piety of the members. Many of them are from Cornwall, a considerable number of whom were members of our society at home. So there's a lot there that would have pleased Henry Ayres and the South Australian Mining Association. All those people from Cornwall who've been members of society at home, well, they've been corralled in again, they've been captured. That's good. The zeal and piety, that's, you know, these are great qualities. And also the role of the local preachers. Although Draper himself is an ordained clergyman, one of the strengths of Methodism, particularly in a place like South Australia, is that much of the evangelical work, uh, much of the day-to-day -day work, can be done by local preachers, lay preachers, if you like. Um, and that's an inherent strength. That helps them to establish themselves. Um, it also means that local preachers, lay preachers, become leaders of men and women. It be means they, uh, they become good at articulating ideas. It means that they are not afraid to stand up in front of their peers and argue points. Um, but more of that in just a moment. For now, all this is good stuff as far as Henry Ayres himself is concerned. But Henry Ayres knows, of course, <coughs> that behind all this, lurks the lawless tenor. The lawless tenor has not gone away. He reads the Cornish newspapers. Uh, they're, they're sent across by J.B. Woodcox and others, uh, the migration agents. He knows what's going on, what's been going on recently at Wade Bridge and other towns across Cornwall where rioting miners have been forcing fair, fair prices uh, for corn and uh, taking bread and so on through the threat of violence and sometimes occasionally actual violence. And there are hints of this in the borough, which no doubt worry as the South Australian Mining Association. In 1847, it said there were 13 pubs. And you wonder who went to the pubs? Well, names like the Cornish Arms, the Redruth Arms, the Miners Arms, uh, is a bit of a clue to who some of those <laughs> people frequenting them might be. So we have a sense that, well, they weren't always in the chapel. Or <laughs> at least that there were uh, competing venues or other entertainment, if I can put it, um, put it like that. And uh, there's one, I think, quite well-known diary, some of you, I'm sure, have come across before, a fellow called Frederick Johnson Hayward, who was at the borough at the time, and he painted a rather different picture to the one painted by uh, the Reverend Draper. And he says, this is Hayward writing, the toughest characters congregated it's in one of the pubs, one of the 13 pubs. Breaking windows, singing and fighting, and the landlord used a cricket bat to clear his house at night. <laughs> On pay night, Saturday, fights would be coming off all afternoon, and the ring formed and kept by two policemen who were powerless to do anything but to see fair play. <laughs> On Sunday mornings, when people should be in chapel, of course. Uh, on Sunday mornings also, there were often eight to ten matches brackets pugilistic, come off at the back of the inn, the house of course being closed on that day. Um, this was a this is the other type of this is the other imagining of the Cornish miners. Well, Henry Eyre he's, he's balancing these two. He's recruiting Cornish miners but he's worried about that reputation, I'm sure. And his worst fears suddenly seem to be realised um, in the borough strike in eighteen forty eight. <coughs> 
um, in the September of that year, um, when there was a strike which effectively paralyzes the mine, um, which the people in Adelaide seemed to come out of nowhere, but actually had been um, boiling up for some little while. There was actually two elements to the strike at the bar. The first was about the assaying of ores, and that's the complicated bit. Um, the second strike, the second element of the strike, was much more simply about levels of wages. Um, as I explained before, the method of remuneration for a tributor was the value of the ore that he had raised. Um, and obviously, the higher the quality of that ore, the more he and his pair were going to earn. A lower quality, particularly if it was lower than he'd expected, uh, would mean less remuneration. And of course, if they were really lucky, and the ore was actually richer than they had thought, then they were going to do particularly well. So getting an assay which was favorable, accurate, yes, but particularly favorable, um, was all important. And uh, the South Australian Mining Association, and Henry Ayres, um, began to get evidence, began to get wind of the fact that there may have been some collusion between the tributaries, the tribute pairs, and the so-called grass captain, Captain Penglay, so Cornish, as the name suggests, that they were somehow colluding and making the assays bigger on paper than they really were. Um, there was an investigation that went on, and, uh, uh, and some new um, things were put in place to try and prevent this, but it still was still happening. So much so that Henry Ayres decided that the superintendent who oversaw all this, not Captain Penglake, but his boss, a chap called Robert Burr, needed to be removed. And so Burr, who was responsible for the overall assay, would be removed, he would be sacked, and things would therefore you know, get better. Burr refused to go quietly, which is not what was expected. Um, he was going to hold out. And he was going, he was holding out because he had the support of the Cornish miners. And well, he might, of course, for the reasons that Luther had been thinking about. Uh, for Henry Ayres, this was dangerous stuff. Um, Barra Mine was 100 miles away, that's a long way away. Um, easy to lose control of events if you're not careful. So, Henry Ayres and a delegation from the South Australian Mining Association uh, travel 100 miles to uh, the borough to dismiss but face to face. When they get there, they're horrified by what they see. Well, if Ayres is. Um, all his worst fears have come true. The Cornish miners have risen up just as they did in the imagination of people. And here, replicated in South Australia, was exactly that kind of um, behaviour that had been all too apparent in Cornwall in recent months. And uh, Henry Ayres dispatches a note to the governor. Uh, he calls it an express note. It takes 11 hours for Horseman Galloping to, to deliver it. And uh, it's essentially calling for government intervention. And Ayres writes that he has seen um, acts of the most violent character, an actual force having taken men up from the shafts, tied together, and carried off the mine. These are the scabs, as it were, who refused to to participate according to uh, Ayers. He says, warrants were issued against two of the ringleaders, but the police were prevented from making the capture by a mob of about 160 men. That's, that, that's a telling phrase, a telling word, a mob. You know, that resonates, a mob. The total number of men now out in revolt, there's another phrase, in revolt, is about 300. The men have virtual possession of the mine Ooh. and have prevented the ore from being carted away. The only work permitted to go on is the whim at the water shaft, that's the pump, or stripping pump, uh, which they threaten to stop. Unless means are taken to stop this, the mine will be ruined. Oh, wow, this is heavy stuff. This being the first time that anything like this has occurred in the province, the deputation feel that it is necessary to act with energy and decision, or otherwise we should be entirely in the hands of the people. 
<laughs> South Australian um, conservative newspaper on the whole, sympathetic to Henry Ayres, um, headlines, revolution at the Barra Barra Mines. South Australian Register, um, edited at this time, owned at this time by a chap called John Stevens, who, the son of a Cornish miner, turned Methodist minister, so has a natural sympathy with the Barra strike. Uh, nonetheless, maybe tongue-in-cheek, but I don't think so, refers to 1848, to the year of European Revolution. And, uh, and there's some correspondence in the pages of that newspaper, which is, kind of suggests that what had been happening in Britain and Ireland and continental Europe was now finding an expression in South Australia, or as one correspondent puts it rather quaintly, on this side of the Atlantic. So, <laughs> hasn't, hasn't looked at his atlas recently, but we know what he meant, we know what he means. Um, and also, Henry Ayres himself had been aware that 1848 and the disruption in Europe had, amongst other things, led to falling copper prices. Um, which is one reason why he was interested in wage rates and remuneration to start off with. So the capitalists of South Australia were also worried about 1848 um, because of the long-term effect, the global impact, if you like, on the South Australian economy. But here now, if there was evidence that the politics as well as the economics were going to impact upon South Australia, this, this would be a worrying development. 26 armed troopers Police troopers are dispatched to the bar. Um, they're expecting trouble. Um, when they get there, they find that heirs have panicked. That the lawless tenant had not taken over the mine in quite the way in which he had um, imagined. That it had been exaggerated. Um, and the police, to their credit, play the whole thing down. Um, and they report back, actually, that the whole thing has been uh, conducted in good humour, which is a phrase that comes up several times. And there's one uh, in the register, sympathetic to the mind, um, one incident where um, a couple of recalcitrants, as it describes, and one or two who apparently did not want to join the strike, from, are tied to hand barrows and carried shoulder high from the mine to the borough township and uh, it says, exposed to the laughter of 150 laughing souls, or words to that effect. Um, it's interesting, when I read that, it reminds me of the, uh, the events of the Captain Swing Riots in the late 1830s, 1839. Captain Swing Riots didn't really penetrate Cornwall very much, they were more southern, southeastern England, and they were to do with wage rates, and different issues for those that exhibited in Cornwall. Um, not to do with dearth as much as with actual rates of labourers and so on and so forth. But leaving that aside, one of the things um, that uh, come out of the Captain Swing riots is the, um, the use of ritual in a riot situation. Um, that's one thing that comes across in this barrel strike, the use of a ritual. And this tying people to a hand barrow and carrying them to the edge of the mine seems to me to be very much like the Captain's Swing um, rituals where uh, parish overseers and the like were tied to wheelbarrows and wheeled to the parish foundry. There was some kind of, and then, and then dumped. There's some sort of echo of um, rural resistance and so on coming across from southern Britain, it seems to me. A glimmer which we see replicated um, in the way in which the miners handled themselves at the borough in 1848. The other thing that is commented on, that instead of the mob, the revolters, as it were, taking charge of this, instead of it being the lawless tenor, it's actually the Methodist local preachers who are in charge. It's the Methodist local preachers who are organizing the strike and also are policing, if that's the right word, its parameters. Uh, they have a monster meeting, as they describe it, at which the miners, uh, or at least the Methodist local preachers, tell them that alcohol is prohibited for the duration of the strike. Um, we don't know the extent to which uh, people acted upon that, 
John Stevens in the Register newspaper noted that approvingly, so he hoped they would stick to it. But that's a measure, it's an insight into um, the way in which the Methodists um, wished themselves to control the strike, to set its parameters, and to act as a kind of restraining influence um, upon it, upon them. But also, the other thing which is interesting about the, uh, the Methodists is that they then begin to articulate aspects about the rights of, of man, about equality, um, about the, the tussle between labour and capitalism, um, phrases which perhaps do echo those of 1848, and which certainly echo those of the Chartist movement in Cornwall, um, and in Britain as a whole. Uh, recent work on Chartism in Cornwall has um, rather undone the existing knowledge of, or the existing view of the level of Chartism. Up until fairly recently, the view was that Cornwall was not a, a centre of Chartism in the way that South Wales or North England and so on were. Um, recent research reveals that actually, in a more modest, smaller scale way, uh, Chartism was actually important in Cornwall, and particularly important in radicalising um, the Methodist movement. Um, the Wesleyans to some extent, but particularly the Bible Christians. Um, so that there is a, a kind of a, a Methodist radicalism emerging in the 1840s in Cornwall, um, articulating Chartist ideas, um, which appear to be echoed in what we hear in the Borough of Strife. So instead of that incoherent outburst of meaningless violence that heirs were describing, we actually see um, a well-controlled, well-thought-out, uh, well-articulated set of uh, grievances, if you like, which go beyond just talking about um, the, uh, the, the, the methods of setting the assays. It's also worth noting but as well as talking about assays, a whole list of grievances that have appeared from the tributors. Um, they complain about the high costs of the power that they have to buy, remember they're self-employed more or less, um, about the candles they have to buy, um, about the level of subscription to the compulsory club and doctor fund in case they're ill and injured and so on and so forth. They come up with a shopping list. They want to discuss this shopping list with Henry Ayres, who's still up there, in a still second bar, um, wants to discuss this with Ayers and the, and the de delegation from uh, South Australian Mining Association. Um, Ayers is resistant. He says very pedantically that the relationship between the company, the Mining Association, and the pairs of tributaries uh, is individual with those contractors, so the whole series of individual contracts. Therefore, they're not in a position to deal with the miners as a whole. Um, very pedantic, kind of legalistic, I suppose. He is persuaded to see sense um, by Inspector Dashwood, the head of the police who's gone up there. So again, we see the police uh, playing a kind of intermediary role, uh, again allowing common sense to, um, to, um, to bear. And what then happens actually seems to be a relatively remarkable, remarkably swift resolution of a lot of the, uh, the grievances and the issues. Maybe Ayers, I don't know if there's any evidence of this, I haven't come across yet, maybe Ayers suddenly is waking up to the implications of the Chartist rhetoric of 1848 and all that, um, and wants to concentrate on getting the miners back to work and sorting out the nitty gritty problems so that the politics, the big picture politics, um, can be um, put to one side. Um, Either way, he agrees to uh, new methods of assaying, he agrees to deductions of the club and doctor fund, and the charges for tools and fuses and powder and candles and so on and so forth. And the tributaries are prepared to go back to work. Um, but in that moment of the tributaries' victory, there's no, no doubt still concerned about the overall cost of running the mine, decides that having given in to the tributaries, tough workmen, skilled miners, he is going to um, cut the wages of all the other workers on the mine. The labourers, the carters, the sawyers, the mechanics, and a whole variety of other people. Some of these people are Cornish, so there will be a sense of 
ethno-occupational or ethno-religious, however you want to describe it, affinity with those tributaries and top workmen who have just made their peace with the mining association. But what is fascinating, and particularly in the background of the context that we've just been talking about, is that the tributaries and the top workmen have none, having got their way, nonetheless come out on strike again in sympathy with the surface workers. Um, evidence of a, a kind of a sophisticated view of uh, worker solidarity and relationship with um, uh, management emerging, I would suggest. This time, the South Australian Mining Association, Henry Ayres, is in no mood to compromise, and it just sits tight. And uh, in the end, the strike is broken by various individuals and groups of individuals essentially go, wanting to go back to work. The Teamsters who came up, come out on strike, decide that they're not going to continue. Various individual miners go back and ask um, if they can be re-employed. And uh, Henry Ayres sits back and lets this happen. He draws up a list of what he calls obnoxious persons. <laughs> um, these obnoxious persons are, of course, the ringleaders. Um, Methodist local preachers amongst them. And, and he said they will be barred from employment and told, this is another interesting bit, told to quit the company's cottages. He also tells those people who've built um, shanty type houses around the mine with the blind eye approval of the mine that they must be torn down. Um, so they're torn down. Ringleaders are evicted from the um, the South Australian Mining Association cottage. It's nearly Christmas now. The, the strike has been going on for um, the end of September, October, November, into December. And um, Ayres relents and gives some a reprieve. Um, and yet others are told to vacate their cottages immediately. This is on Christmas Eve. Um, some of the striking miners have actually left already. And they've gone off to New Zealand, where there's a copper mine on the Kawa Island, I think it's pronounced, which is an insight into, to some extent, how the Cousin Jacks, remember their view of themselves, how they, you know, well, if they don't want me here, that's fine, I'll go to New Zealand, you know. The Cornish are in demand around the expanding mining frontier. Um, and they have this simple method of just applying their skills elsewhere if they don't get the treatment, the remuneration that they want here. Um, Ayres himself has tried to recruit new Cornish miners from recent arrivals at Port Adelaide. Um, but on hearing of the strike, um, these people refuse to be uh, employed as strike breakers. So there again is another kind of sophistication uh, emerging at this time. There's also evidence in the colony itself of sympathy for the Cornish miners. The registered newspaper is a strong vehicle for support. And in its pages, a variety of correspondents express their approval. Um, people write in to pledge support and sometimes even monetary assistance. Here's five guineas for your cause, my old friend's cousin Jackie, writes one uh, letter writer to the, the registered newspaper. Um, at Kapunda, another copper mine with strong Cornish elements in the workforce, um, the miners come together and raise £100, um, which they say is proof of their unity in the common cause. Uh, here's another kind of solidarity. And they say they're going to send this £100 to the borough of strikers, our brethren. Now, brethren in what sense? Co-workers, um, co-Cornish, co-religionists, maybe all of those things. Uh, different kinds of identities merging uh, together. Um, but interesting that Kapunda is watching, <coughs> participating in that sense. Um, nonetheless, by January 1849, it's essentially all over. Um, the miners have gone back to work. Um, it's presented by the South Australian Mining Association, Henry Ayres, as a victory. But in reality, Ayres and the association are shaken by this display of workers, Cornish, Methodist, whatever it is, probably all of those things, um, solidarity. And people in the South Australia generally have taken note of this. One writes to the register says, one thing is certain, that to a great extent, a species of trade union 
has been established to mine among the miners of several mines. Thinking also, I think of Kapunda as well as Barabai. He's overstating the case. Um, there isn't a trade union structure here. Um, we've seen some sophisticated activity, um, but it, it, it has not yet um, some structural manifestations, as it were. Uh, in any case, many of the gold diggers, those people who would have been involved in this strike, the copper miners rather, are enticed away in a year or two to uh, New South Wales, and particularly in Victoria, in the gold rushes. So that's going to undermine the, the sense of cohesion of the workforce. Uh, although, it has to be said, the political association, uh, a radical political organisation which emerges in South Australia um, in the 1850s, um, which articulating ideas very similar to the Chartist ideas back in Britain, uh, it has strongholds in both Kapunda and Abara. And, uh, and Abara, one of its early um, chairmen, is a chap called George Furco, came from Maris Island in Cornwall. So there's a, a feed across there, perhaps, an enduring sense of, uh, of emerging political organisation. Um, but if that idea of a trade union being constructed was an oversimplification and exaggeration. Uh, what the borough strike does do, it seems to me, is to shed new light or some new light by looking at it again, what I'm trying to here, um, on the way in which an emerging Cornish radical tradition in Cornwall uh, was beginning to manifest itself in South Australia. Because, as I, as I have argued, the um, perhaps incoherent um, protests of the lawless tinner uh, that had characterised Cornwall for a hundred years and more was being radicalised and politicised in new ways um, under Chartist influence but into the hands of Methodist local preachers among them in Cornwall. This influence seems to be echoed in South Australia. Um, and although this is not my topic tonight, and we've talked a little bit about Vera's government, it seems to me that this is kind of the uh, the first stage of a trajectory in South Australia, which does indeed lead to the Bering government in, um, uh, in 1910. Um, there are lots of paradoxes along the way, and I'm confronting those paradoxes as I do the research that Dr. Arnold was talking about earlier on, uh, because the Cornish radical tradition, which here in the way that I've described, it does indeed seem to be radical. It seems to be charters. On and so forth. Um, the way that it actually develops in Cornwall in the latter part of the 19th century is essentially manifested in support for the Liberals and the emergent Labour movement, both trade unions and politicised Labour when it comes along, um, uh, receives scant attention in Cornwall, if I can put it in that way. And uh, those in the Labour Party, um, then as now, um, well, now as then, look at Cornwall with an air of frustration and wonder how the liberal tradition survived um, through the 19th century to the 20th and now into the, uh, the early 21st. Without wanting to put you know, too much of a party political slant on this, it is certainly true that Labour never really took off in Cornwall. And, uh, an interesting comparison is between Cornwall and South Wales. Um, in the decades after 1848 and all of that, the Cornish in Cornwall, as well as in Australia, South Australia, seem to be moving towards something like a trade union structure and an attendant labour organisation that we would recognise. Uh, at the same time as they are in South Wales, there are fledgling moves in both Cornwall and Wales. In, in Wales, South Wales, from the coal mining industry, this continues apace, so that by the beginning of the 20th century, one has this hugely impressive South Wales Federation, the Fed, as it was known, um, this tight labour movement um, with uh, strong trade unionism in the mind, uh, labour representation, the early labour representation, Murphy, <laughs> Keir Hardy, and all that. It doesn't happen in Cornwall. Um, why? Well, I think one of the answers, quite simply, is that in contrast to South Wales, which develops so strongly in the way that I think of that, in Cornwall, the bottom falls out of the copper mining industry in 1866, and ten falters um, in the decades thereafter. So those very leaders of men and women who started to 
uh, move towards a fledgling labour movement just as they were in South Wales at the same time. They suddenly find themselves elsewhere. So that in the American West, for example, as Lingham felt, uh, um, or if Lingham felt, who's a uh, historian of labour in uh, the United States mining industry, says that the Cornish became the leaders of the mining labour movement of the West. Well, she means west of the Rocky Mountains, California, and Nevada, and so on and so forth. And you can see the same in South Africa. And you can see the same in Cornwall, uh, in South Australia. Two places conflated in my mind these days. Um, you can see the same in South Australia, um, where, in, against the background of the, uh, uh, the collapse of Cornish copper in the 1860s, but the rise of Munza and Waller Road, There's Moon to Mind, one of my all-time favourite pictures across Moon to Mines from Hamley Hill. Um, Cornish engine house dominating the middle ground, or far middle ground, whatever it is. Um, this built a new centre of uh, Cornish concentration in, um, in South Australia. And uh, what one sees, interestingly, is that some of the old hands, as they are described, to Kapunda and Barra, are enticed to um, uh, Moonsa and Wararoo, and wonders to what extent uh, there's some memory of the 1848 strike in the new trade union structure that does indeed um, emerge. Um, sometimes, again, the evidence is paradoxical. George Voco, the fellow from Marrow's Iron, who was chair of the political association, uh, becomes a mine captain. He kind of, well, but simplistically, changes side. So does Malachi Diebel who was one of the obnoxious men in that list prepared by Henry Eyre. Mm -hmm. He becomes an important mine captain at Moonta, one of the, uh, the important sidekicks, to use the, uh, the phrase of the time, of Captain Henry Richard Hancock and his, and his regime. But what we did see at Moonta is in 1864, um, there are moves towards some kind of trade union movement. There's an important strike in 1864. These are formative days at Munta and Wallaroo, the mines on the Northern York Peninsula, and the miners are feeling their feet, perhaps in the way that they were in 1848 at the bar. This time, however, they're doing, more, they're doing something more about it. They're moving towards that kind of structure that people perhaps imagined was going to emerge after 1848 in the bar. Um, in 1874, um, there's an even more important strike, which has gone down in the mythology of uh, Munta and of Wallaroo. And uh, by that time, <coughs> the origins of, what, of the, uh, the Labour movement, the United Labour Party, the momentum which threw up John Verran and his government in 1910 are clearly discernible. In 1873, before <coughs> that great strike in 1874, um, there is the evidence of the emergence of the uh, Muta Miners Association on the ground of actually recruiting people, of actually trying to make a coherent labour movement. And there's a lovely um, short verse, I, I won't grace it with the word poem, I think it's probably more doggerel, but nonetheless, um, it's, I think it's worth reading out because it has a number of messages contained with it. It appears in the York Peninsula Advertiser, which is one of the main newspapers uh, on Northern York Peninsula in 1873, uh, if you like, on the eve of the big 1874 strike. It's part of the propaganda um, uh, offences, if you like, to get people to organise, to join the fledgling labour movement. And it articulates it in this way. We invite the young and old to join our miners' band. Come and have your name enrolled and join us heart in hand. Cornwall was never conquered yet by men of mighty powers. And shall we all in silence sit and show ourselves like cowards? We have the motto, one and all, this coat of arms is ours. Then let us rise, both great and small, to carry out our endeavours. The last line doesn't quite <laughs> scan or rhyme. It kind of reduces its impact a little. And I guess the bloke sat there. Sucking the end of his pencil for hours on end and really tell, oh, it. One knows the feeling. Um, but there's a lot in there in those three short stanzas. Join our miners' band, you know, the band of brothers and all that. 
Have your name enrolled. <coughs> Put your name to it. Don't just say you're on our side. Yeah. There you go. Join us heart and hand, you know, emotionally, fully, completely. Um, Cornwall was never conquered yet. And that's a wonderful phrase. It tells you something about that enduring Cornish ethnoid, ethno uh, occupational identity behind all of this. Um, in the Civil War, um, that's a British one, um, that phrase, Cornwall was never conquered yet, was articulated time and again um, as a form of resistance against the intruding roundheads who were seen as outside interference. And this phrase, Cornwall was never conquered yet, I mean, you still see it. I mean, uh, Oswald Pryor was uh, articulated in the 1950s, for example. But here it is. It's obviously a catch cry that people are aware of, and they're going to respond to it. Cornwall was never conquered yet. You know, and this is going to apply to us in the minds of Northern York Peninsula um, as well. Um, you know, by men of mighty powers. You know, we're not going to be intimidated by them. Because we're not being conquered, you know, we've not been conquered yet. We have the motto, one and all, uh, which is the Cornish motto, which is wheeled out by um, the trade unionists on Northern York Peninsula. Um, um, several, probably numerous occasions, you know, and it's kind of tailor-made for that feeling of solidarity, even though lots of people in Cornwall think it's an ironic motto. Um, actually, it is quite a powerful motto in terms of appealing to a sense of solidarity, um, the common cause, the common good, and so on and so forth. This coat of arms of, is our. Then let us rise, both great and small, and so on and so forth. You know, every phrase is a resonant of what the trade unionists are trying to do. And uh, so I would argue that by 1873, by 1874, one is beginning to see the long-term effects of 1848 and all that, but against the background of the changing political and economic <coughs> climate in Cornwall, as well as in South Australia. And there's an interesting symbiosis there, um, as well as the paradoxes, which I think we need to understand and tease out. I think that's my... Cute myself to stop. Fascinating two of the force uh, from 1848 and not quite to 1910, but you've given us the foundation for 1910. Uh, obviously, explain all that. Uh, so, Phil, thank you very much indeed. I'll thank you a bit more in a minute, but I just wonder if we have any questions that people would like to ask. We have some time for questions. Yes. So, was the nature of the remuneration in Winter the same as in Toronto? I mean, has the entrepreneurial aspect militated against trade unionism and power and not in Exactly the same, yes, it was. Um, which. Yeah, there, is a, there is a tension in this, there's yet another of those paradoxes. Because, uh, looking at that on face value, you think you know, that competitive edge between the different groups would have militated against collective action. Because people think, oh, you know, that lot over there, we're going to do them down. We, you know, we'll bid slightly lower than we think they'll bid, and then when they, bid, when they go lower again, you're really angry because you could have gone lower. You know. there's, there's evidence of that. Um, but there's also evidence that the miners themselves begin to lose faith in that system. Um, earlier on, in borough days, even, they see it as a way of, mean, a means of making money. Um, not least people could with the could with the assayers. Um, you know, you, you can use your skill. I think they've lost confidence in that by the time you've got the great big industrial conglomerates of uh, Muta and Wallaroo, or indeed Calumet and Hecla in Michigan. But it's a very similar kind of change in attitude. And suddenly, tribute and tuck work just becomes part of the armory of the management's control of wages. And it's no longer the means by which you can sort of get ahead by being wily and clever and deploying your skills and so on and so forth. And there's quite a lot of agitation against the contract system that moved from Wallaroo at the end of the 19th century and really up to the Great War, that, that period as well. A lot of tinkering uh, with the system. Um, and when W.G. Spence comes across, you know, the great trade union um, agitator, organiser, uh, he thinks that the system there of tribute and tuck work is antiquated. And, uh, and he, um, he's extolling the, 
the workers to basically uh, try and get it, uh, to get it abandoned. But of course it influences uh, the contract system as it merges a broken hill and so on and so forth. So contracting in that way is deeply imbued in mining industry uh, here as in, as in other places. Keith? I was just going to uh, question whether my belief is that Henry Ears, when he first went up there, uh, didn't settle things immediately and turned to come home, and his buggy hit a rock or somebody tipped it over, and he rather kind of lost his dignity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I think that's after, yeah, after the initial visit, they're on the way home, and the, the, uh, the buggy is tipped. Yeah, that's some sort of... Well, there's a lot of wry amusement in the South Australian Register. And uh, it doesn't actually say that this is done deliberately. But there is a sense that, you know... <laughs> um, but it was probably... You know, there was another denting of heirs of dignity. Um, he didn't, you know... He, he didn't enjoy those, those days. Uh, those days at Barago coming back. They were a shock to him. And remained a shock, I think. Yes. Oh, is, there any, I, is there any evidence that the Methodist lay preachers, as they led their brothers, were able or were willing to articulate their radicals in, in terms of the language of their faith? Brothers, let's remember Matthew 7, verses 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of that in uh, 1864 and 1874. Um, see, less of it in 18. In the eight, 1848. Although now that now that Trove exists, you can plunder all the newspapers as much as you like, and the stuff you missed as the ink has gone wonky. You know, go back and ponder and ponder. Whereas in the old days, you'd be really much more constant. Really. But uh, yeah, that's a very interesting point. Certainly later, Newton Waru, the whole thing is imbued in biblical talk, um, and that you know, that's part of its persuasion, part of its power. So it goes beyond just the, the local preacher saying, this is what I think. You know, healing, so a much greater authority. Not an to 25. You said uh, that the term one and all was seen somewhat as ironic in the <coughs> Could you explain that a bit more? <coughs> yes, I mean, in, in Cornwall, people imagine but they're not very good at combining. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that that's true, but it does uh, it does reflect some of the kind of the topography of Cornwall, if you like. If you look at a map of Cornwall, I haven't got one, perhaps I should have done. Um, even today, there's no real big census. Truro has emerged as the Cornish capital, um, the seat of local governments is there, and the cathedral and stuff. Um, but essentially, Cornwall, well, Cornwall has been described as a patchwork of kind of mutually suspicious small city-states. So there's the Rick Road, and the Campbell, the feud up in the top, and the Taiwan, and so forth. And that, they have a sense of competition um, between them, which is, um, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's a yet another myth, really. Um, but people in Cornwall like to imagine that it's paradoxical. But they also like to imagine that, in the same breath as well, that there are opportunities where people will come together, and one and all is important. Um, and after all, you, know, you see it all over the place in Cornwall, as you know, from, from visiting um, on coats of arms and didn't know what names of clubs, names of ships, all that sort of stuff. I had a similar question um, in terms of that time, did they see themselves as a nation without a nation? So uh, people unified, but there wasn't actually a nation, and certainly made it even worse because they had religion. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's an interesting question. I mean, the whole question of ethnic identity um, is a complex one. Um, I mean, if you ask 19th century, uh, well, there's a wonderful story which is told, I can't remember all of the details, but it's in A.K. Hamilton Jenkins' kind of classic book, which you might know, called quite simply The Cornish Miner. And he describes an old dame school, um, one of those pre-education act schools where roughly educated elderly ladies um, set up their own schools. They thought, 
you know, the three R's and so on and so forth. And in this, according to um, according to Hamilton Jenkin, um, the, the lady in a particular dame school asks people to describe Cornwall. What is Cornwall? And then she said, is it a, is it a nation? Is it an island? I forget what the other one is. I can't remember. I'm spoiling my own story. But anyway, <laughs> one of the little kids says, it's neither a nation nor an island. And, and she then said, well, what is it then? And he said, it's kitched to a foreign country by the top hand. Kitched is a word in the old Cornish language. Kitched is a join. Join to a foreign country, well, that would be England, <laughs> by the top hand, that's a little bit of land that joins Cornwall to Devon and it's not part of the dividing river Tamar. Um, that is a nice little story, I think, because you know, it may be, you know, it has a ring of authenticity about it, but it shows the complexion of identity. What is certain is that uh, in the 19th century, the, the Cornish, on the back of that myth and cousin Jack and so on and so forth, um, they nurtured an identity which was built on um, hard rock mining and deep steam engineering. And as I suggested, that was a transnational identity. When people, when they thought about Cornishness in the middle of the 19th century, they thought about Colombia and Chile and South Australia and Victoria and, and so on and so forth. So to that extent, there is a strong ethno-occupational, ethno-religious identity built around the territory of Cornwall. And it's interesting that even though, um, even at the height of mining, a lot of people are not involved in the mining industry, nonetheless, when people reach for iconography and description, you know, they, they turn to the miners. Uh, people normally by now have asked me, well, what, how do women feature in this? Uh, very masculine narrative. And the, the first answer is, so I'm probably answering a question that somebody's out there waiting for. I want to get the answer in, you know, <laughs> the preemptive strike and all that. Um, but that myth of Cousin Jack that I've been um, uh, going on about, there is, it seems to me, a mirror image myth of Cousin Jenny, which says that the Cornish woman somehow is also uh, innately imbued with certain superior qualities. But in her, in her case, uh, she has this quality um, to bring order and domesticity to the rigours of the far-flung frontiers of Australia or America. And she would succeed in that where competing ethnic groups would fail. This is kind of the story of Cousin Jenny. And part of the reality, particularly in terms of the story that we're telling, is that although in Wesleyan Methodism, they were resistant to women playing <coughs> major roles in the church. The Bible Christians, quite early on, uh, allow women to take up those kind of roles. And there's um, quite a, a famous figure who was in Queensland and in South Australia, Serena Thorne, who came from Thorne family on the border of uh, North Devon and Cornwall. So there was a, um, a tradition of female local preachers in the Bible Christian Church. And we know that in 1874, um, we know anecdotally, well, also from prior stories and so on, but also from quite extensive press reports, and also in what W.G. Spence recorded when he came across the visit, that the women played an important part in, uh, uh, in the strike of that year, in motivating uh, the men, in discouraging the blacklegs, and so on and so forth. Um, and that ends with part of the story, part of the mythology. Not quite sure how we got there. Yes. <laughs> Ayers provided some housing. So who were the people who were still living in the riverbanks? And did this create some sort of internal conflict within Borough? About those who had and those who didn't? Um, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think that there is some sense of... Uh, there are issues of status there, as you're suggesting. And, uh, and we know that you know, the early cottages are for the mine captains and so on. So, I mean, I suspect that uh, a lot of people in those company cottages are the, uh, the tributaries who are the local creatures and so on. And uh, the other people who are digging their homes in the, uh, uh, in the Barrow Creek. I mean, people knew the Barrow Creek was not a good idea. Very occasionally, it flooded. <laughs> I mean, not very often, but when it did flood, you know, it wasn't just flooding, it was you know, catastrophic. Um, so, I, uh, I mean, I think you're right. I think that there's some sort of degradation, some sort of gradation going on, going on there. 
right at the back. Uh, is it not true that the early um, or the primitive Methodists and the Bible Christians of the period we're talking about, many of them were, were very much influenced by Christian socialism? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think by the, the end of the 19th century, uh, when we had a, this kind of coherent social democracy movement emerging with the likes of John Verum, you know, they are Christian socialists, effectively. And uh, you know, Verum says that religion is politics. Um, that's one of his favourite sayings. And he says that you know, being on earth is not just a question of being good and going to heaven. It's uh, a case of being here and making the world a better place than having been in that. And he says that time and again. And that's, but he, he articulates that very strongly. He was a primitive Methodist, of course. And he was, a, he was critical of the Wesleyans, who he thought were, you know, sorry about Tories and so on. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that the Register was a paper that tended to support the workers, whereas the South Australian supported the establishment. Is that something that was sort of sustained over a, a longer period than just the strikes? And was it sort of significant in South Australia? Um, I think it was, yes. I mean, um, I forget essentially when uh, Stevens throws it all up and then he dies in the end of the book. Um, but yes, I mean, it, it was a sort of a, a, a kind of a radical voice. It was also a gingering voice as well. It didn't let people get away with stuff, you know. There were, a number of libel cases against uh, the register and against Stevens personally. And uh, some of these are documented. There's a very nice biography in this, the Australian Dic Dictionary of Biography, which you can read online. And, uh, and there are cases where um, Stevens is found against, uh, but is awarded a um, uh, fine of one penny or something like that. But that you, know, you can see the distinction between the way the law is being applied with a degree of pragmatism and, and so on. The, uh, Philip, the 1856 uh, legislation that gave uh, the non-property based male franchise here in South Australia ahead of anywhere else in the yeah. world and the secret ballot yeah. ahead of anywhere else, does that have any linkage at all with, with some of this? I think it probably does. I mean, I think, you know, that radical climate and, the, mm. and so on and so forth. And then they on votes for women. And, mm. yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, South Australia is in the forefront of all sorts of stuff. Um, it breaks the, uh, the link between uh, church and state mm. um, before anywhere else in the British Empire. Mm. So, you know, it a kind of, South Australia becomes a kind of laboratory. Mm. You know, and there's all that you know, Douglas Pike and Paradise of the Senate, yeah, yeah. you know, even in its earliest days. Um, South Australia had that particular flavour. Um, in those early days, the Methodists, the non-conformists, are, are by no means the majority. Um, but by the, I don't have the figures with me, but by the end of the century, you know, the non-conformists are a very strong voice in South Australia. Um, very strong voice. And, and as you know, just saying earlier, in comparison to Victoria and the Eastern States. Yeah, yeah. Any more questions? I've got one more which really picks up partly what Bob was talking about. Uh, and you mentioned how the Methodist preachers in Burra were on the one hand uh, uh, encouraging the activity, but also then setting the, par the parameters uh, around that activity. Um, did uh, the, the South Australia by the 1960s was somewhat of a wowser state uh, in terms of licensing laws and things like that. Uh, do we have them to thank for that too? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess the uh, part of the answer is yes. Um, although it's interesting that Don Dunstan, in his uh, political uh, autobiography, kind of alludes to that. Mm. And, he said, and, and he said that you know, part of his job was to make South Australia a more fun place, mm. which he did. Um, but nonetheless, he saw strands of continuity between uh, who he was and uh, mm. when he was a Cornish descent, of course, and what he wanted to do, you know, the kind mm. of uh, social democracy and the kind of um, essential concern for freedoms and equality and so on and so forth. But even though he was sort of quite disgusted, I think, by aspects of that mm. uh, wowserism, nonetheless, he saw that there was a, a, there was a positive tradition of which mm. he, was a, he was a part. Mm. We have time for one more question, if uh, there's one still out there. Yes? Were there any other um, 
trades groups that sort of rivaled um, the Cornishmen in Barra and Kapunda that early in South Australia's history? I mean, stone masons or um, uh, I mean, Actually, no, they become important later on. And, yes, uh, and there's almost kind of yeah. two labour movements going on in South Australia. For, mm -hmm. You know, there's a kind of Adelaide-based um, and, uh, and the, uh, a copper mining industry base. But um, I think early on, I mean, the activity doesn't there doesn't seem to have been that coalescence uh, in the way that there was. I mean, it's, it's very early on in the history of South Australia. I mean, incredibly early, really. So I mean, I think later on we see different trajectories. So um, shearers hadn't bonded, and dockers hadn't bonded, and lampers and people like that hadn't really bonded in that same in that, way. In that same way. Yeah. I mean, there were lots of people. I mean, we're talking about at the height of the strike when they're all out. But there's about 600 people on strike. I mean, that's huge numbers. Huge numbers. Well, Philip, thank you very much indeed. That has been a fascinating tour of the force, as I, I mentioned before. The one major problem we now suffer from this is we have to wait to 2015 uh, for the book that comes. Uh, <laughs> but it'll be well worth the wait because uh, you've given us a fascinating weaving together not only of things within South Australia's history, but also linking that to the uh, foundational traditions back in Cornwall and, uh, and other issues in, in, in Europe, generally speaking. So to bring all that together and then see how these, uh, these factors all came together in this particular place in South Australia, and in particular in places like Burra Burra and, uh, and York Peninsula, or Northern York Peninsula, uh, is, uh, it, it's just a fascinating uh, journey. So thank you very much for that. So if you please join us.